Hello, I'm Ken Kurdzel, and I'm joined today by my partner, Katie Davis. Katie and I together lead our firm's higher education collegiate athletics team. Um, welcome to News and Brews, our weekly to the point video series where we discuss new developments in collegiate athletics related to the coronavirus pandemic and other matters. We're excited to continue featuring financial voices from the industry. And in previous episodes, we've touched on the importance of engaging with various stakeholders during these times. Joining us for the discussion today is Melissa Stuckey, Associate AD at the University Athletic Association, which is the intercollegiate athletics arm of the University of Florida, and Steve Noose, a member of the Board of Directors, Chair of the UAA Audit Committee, alumni and fan of the Gators. Also alongside is Katie, with, who is participating today as a stakeholder in her role as the audit partner for the UAA. And she is also a fan and alumni of the Gators. So go the Gators. Gators. So welcome, Melissa. Let's start by hearing how the coronavirus pandemic has impacted your operations and how you're engaging with various stakeholders as you continue navigating these changes. Thanks, Ken. I appreciate the opportunity to join you all today. And I think all of us have probably had some similar experiences, uh, you know, related to the pandemic. And I appreciate the opportunity to share ours here, uh, you know, with the Gators. And, you know, one thing, you know, it's, it's interesting, this, this uh, you know, discussion alone is a big change, right? So all of us working, both working remotely and then meeting and visiting and talking with each other remotely uh, at the start of this, I think was a, it was a significant adjustment to the operation, kind of just, I use this, you know, my brain doesn't work that way. And so it's been a retraining uh, for a lot of us just to, to get used to this. And so I think, you know, we're, we're doing that, but look forward to the time and opportunity where we may be able to be all back together, right? And truly in the brewery together. So, uh, you know, for, for our operation, probably the, the most significant impact is our industry that essentially shut down. Right. So the things that we're about and that we do both uh, being on a college campus and then athletic and, and athlete related has all just come to a complete stop. And so uh, Steve and I have had this discussion a few times. You know, you at no time did you envision that that could even happen. Uh, I don't think you would have ever said like a whole baseball season uh, in the state of Florida would be canceled. It just you didn't, your mind didn't fathom that, um, you know, and then, so I th also think too, it's become really important how we take care of our folks and you're working remotely. Uh, and that's been another adjustment is, is get everybody up and running and working and still being productive and, um, but doing so at arm's length. So taking care of your people has been another challenge uh, as well. Yeah, those are good, good thoughts. And Steve, thank you for joining us. Happy to have you on today. Um, tell us a little bit about the role of <laughs> governance in higher education and how you've been engaging the UAA leadership during this pandemic. Yeah, the, you know, the, the role of corporate governance for an athletic association is, is critical. Um, you focus on people, processes, and control. Um, all three of those have been disrupted. And so you, you do have a little bit of, of a concern um, each year, the audit committee in conjunction with the board and, and the staff, we go through and do a risk assessment. Pandemic or COVID-19 is not on the risk assessment and, and hasn't been, you know, it will be in the future, some type of pandemic, you know, uh, you know, response. So everything that we've done, you know, is, is on the fly. Uh, the thing that you can rely on is the fact that your governance structure that was in place before we got into COVID-19 is still there, i.e. the people. Um, Melissa and I talk um, and I get updates from our athletic director, Scott uh, Strickland, on, on a daily basis. Um, you know, they're, they're a, uh, an email alert. You know, it's not like he's calling me on the telephone, you know, each day. But uh, just to update us on, you know, what's going on in the, in the city, um, as well as what's going on with the staff. And then, you know, finally, uh, with respect to sports. Um, my conversations with Melissa is to make sure, you know, of the people, processes, and control, do we still have all our key people? Is there somebody that could not come in to work because of COVID-19 family issues or, you know, just their fear factor, you know, maybe at a different level and it's better for them to, to not come to work. Um, can they still work from home? Well, 
you know, Zoom and GoToMeeting and, and some of the other options, you know, have, have really opened up a whole different opportunity for people, you know, and so you're almost able to continue your daily activity without missing a beat there from the standpoint of, of people. Processes are going to change and everybody's been flexible there, but you're still getting payroll out. You're still making deposits. You're still you know, making your disbursements, you know, and so those fundamentals are still there. And as long as you continue to have checks and balances, you know, I think, you know, you're moving along, you know, in the right manner. Right. Um, then, you know, the control aspects, you know, will take care of themselves. Some of the controls have to be a little bit different. We're now maybe a little bit more focused on IT controls and making sure that people are working off of VPN versus just Wi-Fi, you know, somewhere so that you don't have cybersecurity challenges, um, you know, and so we've evaluated, you know, the staff has evaluated, you know, where they are on that front and, and making sure that people that are dealing with, you know, personal information or secure information or critical financial information, um, you know, that we limit, you know, who, who we distribute that to and, and who we have discussions on. So, you know, we're never really planned for this. Um, we've been doing fly you know but again you know if you have good people in the right positions then they, you know they react accordingly and so far we're continuing to you know to move forward yeah no those are some great points especially in the it security area that sounds like a a whole another episode at some point actually for katie and i so absolutely katie, what are some best practices that you recommend for management to engage effectively with governance during this uh, current situation I think first management needs to work with governance to define their roles. Um, who's going to be responsible for making changes? What does governance expect as far as do they need to authorize the change or just remain informed? How often do they want to, um, you know, be reached out for consultation and are they going to initiate any of that or expect to hear from management in regards to that? Um, really with the goal of making sure that there aren't multiple forces moving in different directions. You want to make sure everyone's moving forward in the same direction with clarity around uh, who's going to be doing what. Um, you also want to look at um, how you are doing things. So as as they talked about, you know, using electronic communications, looking at IT controls, the people in the processes are still moving forward, but are there ways you can rethink doing things beyond the pandemic? And collaboration with governance can help to foster additional innovation. Uh, you know, the more voices and the more perspectives always um, has additional insight into new decisions and new ideas. Um, but really, in addition to that, uh, governance should also have a finger on the pulse of um, the financials, especially right now when there's so much uncertainty and <laughs> You know, all operations have pretty much ceased uh, to exist for the time being. So what does that mean from a financial picture? And what does governance need to know and understand under various scenarios as um, as they're moving forward and making tough decisions? The more financial data that's available can help provide context around that so that decisions are more well informed. Yeah, so Katie makes a great point there about providing transparent financial information uh, to foster effective decision making, something we talk about a lot on this series and in general. Um, Melissa, I've known you for a long while and you often talk about the idea of putting color around the numbers and kind of yeah. what that means. Um, so what kind of financial information are you sharing with Steve and other stakeholders right now and how does that help you paint a more complete financial picture? Yes, I, you know, and I think that's all like a really great point, too, because it, it is part of the challenge of this, right? Because you have kind of the, I'll call it the public facing, right? What, you know, that, that could have a real effect on your brand. And so you want that messaging and, and all of that to be externally um, be understood and, and thorough. And so, and the financials are a part of that. And so making sure that the board and your various board committees have a good understanding of exactly what does it mean. Here too at the University of Florida, we have levels of governance structure too, right? So you've, you've got your internal structure, you have your board, and then there's the board of trustees all the way up through the board of governors for the state of Florida. So sort of each of those, that sort of that message, and again, putting that clarity. And so 
Well, we, you know, we had a quarter close uh, during this time period. And so there was only about 15 days in that quarter that the financial information was really impacted. So it was hard to put a story around that because you don't you wouldn't see the real impact yet but we actually have gone through our this would be a normal time for us uh, to put the budget together so normally we're playing baseball games and softball games and, and working on next year's budget so we, had, we did have some some more time frankly uh, to, to do that and then um, we we're planning to share that actually uh, next week we, there's a subcommittee of our board that will review that budget in detail and at that time, it will be an opportunity to kind of tell a story. And, you know, I think that the even more challenging is there's so many potential scenarios. So it, it's not that you don't want to share. It's just you don't know. Right. And so just being thorough and um, being will in its fluid. Right. So being willing to have continued dialogue. You know, this is what we know today. We understand tomorrow could look different right. and here's the things we're thinking about adjusting and so that's some of the information that we've been sharing um, mm -hmm. with our governance uh, boards so steve how have you historically used that information uh, that melissa has shared for strategic planning and decision making and and how might that change now under the current environment well i think the the responsibility of the audit committee and, and board is, is to challenge the assumptions, you know, that are there. Um, and, and my fear, um, you know, uh, the last couple of months is, okay, you know, we're going to have a dozen options to have to consider for our, our budget for the, uh, we're on a fiscal year, uh, June 1st. So uh, Melissa and the staff, you know, uh, took a chance to an opportunity. We backed up the, you know, the sub budget subcommittee meeting, you know, so that they could buy a couple more weeks of time um, to do a couple things, evaluate different options, as well as see how things played out. And, you know, if we, you know, in Florida had not been moving to the first phase of coming out, um, you know, it could be a whole different scenario. So uh, my discussions with Melissa have been, you know, we have plan A, plan B, uh, we might have to go to a C, D, and E, um, but I think everybody's flexible with that. So. Uh, you know, certainly the 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 reserves that we have built up over over a period, we know that those reserves are there, so we don't have any critical issues. Um, you know, but there can be some challenging times ahead, uh, depending upon you know how how everything plays out. So we have some contingency plans. Um, you know, staff is you know you know evaluating different options. We're not putting a lot of information out there for the public you know, to, to see at the moment, because they, they tend to take that and run with it and, and we fake news and everything else out there. So, you know, we need to be prudent in what information we as a university re release, and we need to make sure that uh, the board of directors, the audit committee, um, staff are all on the same page. And then our president, you know, of the university is keeping the board of trustees and the board of governors, you know, involved and and updated on what's going on. And so it, it, there is a seamless line of communication, um, you know, within those ranks, as well as, you know, the external auditors and internal auditors. I mean, those are critical. I mean, I, you know, I anticipate you coming to us and asking us questions, or what, what have you done? You know, what have you done differently? You know, how are you changing the game plan moving forward? So, you know, we have some of those aspects, you know, and we'll share that with our external auditors and our internal auditors to see how to, make sure that there continues to be good controls and that the proper checks and balances are in are, are in place and we're not overloading it. And, you know, we don't want to have so many controls that we took off, you know, being able to get work done on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. And Ken, I would just add to that, you know, at the University of Florida, both institutionally and then athletics, we're, we're fortunate to come from a position of strength. So, mm -hmm. Right. So I think you also have to look at sort of the, the premise of what impact when. Right. So currently the impact actually for us with the cancellation of spring sports and spring events is actually a cost savings to the association at the end of the day or really cost neutral. And so kind of what you plan around that is going to look a little bit different 
as we just continue to move forward towards football season, right? So ultimately, um, the revenue stream is impacted by football. So it's hard sometimes to put color around on a timing perspective, right? So spring has been, we've been able to, to manage um, spring and then, but now as we go forward, again, that communication, discussion, transparency are all going to remain important just as we navigate, you know, what football season looks like. No, absolutely. And one thing we know with certainty is that normal is not going to look like what it was pre mid-March. Right. Uh, normal is going to be something different as we go forward. So, Melissa, are there, what are some of the different projections? You know, Steve mentioned having maybe a dozen different projections of where things might go. Can you um, highlight a couple of those projections and maybe other other stakeholders that you're sharing that with? Yes, and so I, I think where what you have is you continue to have a fluid situation, right? And and first, it's really governed by your particular state. And to Steve's note, right, if we were in phase one and now phase two as a state, things might look different for us, right? So the discussion that maybe the, the University of Florida is having might look different than a university in the north, northern, northeastern part of the country because we're just at different phases um, of, of opening things up. And so what you do right now is you say, okay, we're going to plan to have a football season, but there's a couple of things that, that go along with that. We need students on the campus at the University of Florida. So, but that decision is going to be made by a state body versus individual athletic departments, right? So, so you're following that guidance there. So if we assume then that, that we have students back, then next, what does that look like for our fans? And honestly, like that's just an evolving situation. Uh, in talking with Steve, one of the things that we note is, you know, we're I think in week nine or week 10 of this situation. And then there's still, you know, over three months before football is scheduled, at least the games to start. So, you know, there is some time left to adjust. Um, you know, we need student athletes back. Uh, so that's those those plans are being put into place. Um, and so that that's a key obvious element uh, to us being able to participate. And from truly from a financial perspective, you, you look at a number of different scenarios. So, you know, can we can they play football games and we keep television and sponsorship revenue? But there's been a sentiment pretty much across the board that we don't want to play sports without fans. So, OK, now then how can you have fans in your facilities? And so there's there's lots of internal discussion going on, but it's challenging because you can't predict right now. Right. Right. So, Katie, part of your responsibility as an audit partner uh, involves evaluating the conditions about an, uh, an entity or an organization, their ability to continue as a financial going concern. Um, how do athletic directors, CFOs, and others in governance work together to evaluate that business continuity? Yeah, and you know, today's environment, your hands are full managing this crisis, so you may not be spending a whole lot of time looking out further than the next few weeks or few months. Um, but accounting standards uh, require public institutions um, under the government rules to look at 12 months beyond the end of their fiscal year to identify whether there are any conditions or events that would pose a substantial doubt about their ability to continue operating or what's known as a going concern. Um, and just as a side note for you private schools out there, the 12 month measures similar except it's from the date your audit's released. So your window of time is actually a little bit longer than what a public institution would be under. Um, but it, you know, in general, in the college athletics industry, there's nothing at this point to indicate that athletics programs are going to completely go under and close their doors by the end of summer 2021. Um, but it's important to be thinking ahead and making plans um, as you mitigate any threats. Um, and you can do this by evaluating liquidity, cash flow forecasts, uh, your ability to access additional funding through donations or um, financing, uh, you know, grants, and your ability to collect on existing guaranteed deals um, or renegotiate contracts or implement any other cost containment type measures. And so as you're talking through that um, and 
you know, as your auditors, I will be having those conversations with both of you as well as with Scott and potentially some others to see what is it that you're looking at? What are you projecting? How comfortable do you feel that you'll be able to continue operating? Um, and the more information that you have and that you've been able to engage um, with input from other stakeholders, the more prepared you'll be able to be um, as you're talking, about, you know, if you're talking to your boosters and your debt holders and your multimedia rights holders, your apparel companies, travel providers, et cetera, you know, all of these people can tell you where they're at, right? Because COVID's impacting everybody. It's impacting all of them just like it's impacting you. And so what's the impact of the pandemic on them? And what does that mean for you as far as, um, especially cash flow production standpoint? Yeah. So, um, you know, really as an auditor, we will be, you know, coming into this knowing there is an elevated degree of uncertainty um, we don't expect you to have a crystal ball, but if we can see that it, there has been a robust analysis based on the best information available at that time, just like you talked about, um, then that's really what we're going to be looking for. And, the, you know, the more input that you have from various stakeholders within, you know, within the athletics department, as well as, you know, your board members and other external people around campus, um, that's going to go a long way. And Katie, I think, yeah, but, and I would add to that too, I think this particular subject matter, right? So in, in the situation where there's a good governance structure and there's good communication, those things are really kind of naturally occurring then, right? Because there's, there's vested interest and um, you have the format being, whether it be board meetings or emails or, or various other communication tools that you would have used during sort of, I'll call it normal situation, those things now just become that much more important and everyone's used to that level of communication, right? And used to that, um, you know, providing those numbers. And so I think that that's helpful when you have a good governance structure in place. Absolutely. Well, and I'll give a plug for uh, Steve News being one who uh, enforces a good governance structure. I was used to be the audit partner in charge of the UAA audit. I remember distinctly remember the first time I met Steve, he came in as the new audit chair and he plopped down these huge thick books on corporate governance and the role of the audit committee that he expected every one of his audit committee members to read and, uh, and digest. So um, he's, he's an outstanding audit committee chair. He's got a very clear eye towards what good governance means. So um, well, the, gover the governance aspect sometimes is easy when you work with good people and really smart people. And I mean, even in this pandemic time, you know, staff at, at the University of you know, uh, have, are looking for that silver lining. And an example of that silver lining would be a bond refinancing. Who would have thought that there could be an economic upside going through this process? Everybody's just been focusing on the downside. So mm -hmm. staff have looked at and evaluated the opportunity to, to do a bond refinancing and, and even take a little bit extra you know, at a much lower interest rate to make sure we have cash reserves for that rainy day. If we don't use it, we can just pay it down sooner. You know, there's no prepayment penalties. So, you know, that creativity and, and being on the cutting edge all the time of always looking to create opportunity out of, you know, a, a challenge um, gives the board peace of mind, um, you know, and, and, and can give, you know, our fan base peace of mind that, we're going to still continue and we're going to make it through this all together. Well, I like the idea of ending on a positive note. That was a great point, Steve, um, and, and certainly points to the positive of trying to make opportunity out of a, out of a crisis. Uh, my final question, though, today, not to be overlooked, the uh, the brew side of things. I um, <laughs> want to know what everybody's drinking. Most we're going to cover the, the ladies first. So, Melissa, would you share what your, uh, your brew of the day is? So, my brew of the day, I am always, I am a... Not too many of them, but a dark beer drinker. So I have a funky Buddha. So that's near where you are, actually, Steve. Um, and <laughs> this is a chocolate porter. Um, nice. Smuggler. So it is delicious and um, tasty. And again, I go for the porters and stouts. Good choices. And Katie? So I mix it up. Uh, we have been supporting local breweries uh, to our hometown in Gainesville. And this one is from Swamphead Brewery. We've talked about a lot 
uh, the beginning of the month, they did a Star Wars special. So this is from their Dark Side bundle. It's called The Power of the Dark Side. And it's a cherry sour. Um, I'm sometimes iffy on sours, but it's actually really good. I, I thought it might take like, taste like cough syrup, but it doesn't. Um, it's tasty. So uh, Ken and I like to rate on a scale of zero to five. I would give it a four for sure. Good. So. And Steve, did you bring a beer along? Uh, you know, I, I didn't do chocolate and I didn't do caffeine, but I did do lobster. There we go. There you <laughs> go. Board, uh, part of Hawaii. Uh, just the family just got back from Hawaii uh, a little while ago and, and uh, you know, experienced this over there and liked that lager beer. And, and uh, so, you know, we, we, we try and do something a little bit different today and, and tying it in with a prior, prior vacation. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. Well, I'm drinking uh, to go alongside with um, Katie's is a Swamphead beer. It's the the other side. It's the light side uh, that was released uh, from Swamphead for their May the 4th celebration. It's called Rebel Scum. Um, so I'm playing the light side to her dark side today. So, yeah. uh, so. There you go. That's a good one. I would give mine a, probably a four and a quarter. It's a really good beer. So I'm enjoying yeah. it. So, well, thank you to Melissa and Steve for sharing your voices with us and our viewers. Um, we really believe in this idea that the financial voice is an important one that should be shared more as athletic programs intend to tell, tell their story in a proactive, strategic manner. Um, and it's our goal to help tell that financial story each week here on News & Brews. So please tune in with each week on Thursday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern for us uh, for a new episode. And um, you can visit our website uh, to see prior episodes. In the meantime, you can follow us on Twitter and for more news on collegiate athletics landscape that's rapidly evolving. So thank you for tuning in and cheers and go Gators. Thank you, Ken. Thanks. Cheers. Gators. Cheers. 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 Cheers.